start now. So um, welcome everybody, thanks for joining in. Um, today I guess is kind of a little bit special um, because it is, we are sort of officially celebrating um, NAIDOC week this week and I thought what a better time to ask someone who is really passionate about connecting with culture and connecting with our um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities um, and that is Andy Hare but before we get started um, on behalf of the association and myself I'd just like to pay respect and acknowledge the traditional um, custodians of the land in which we meet and work and pay respect to our elders past and present um, and if we have any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are present in today's webinar to pay my respects to them as well and um, I acknowledge that the land that I'm standing on at the moment is, um, or always has and always will be, the lands of the Wodi Wodi people who are part of the Darawal Nation, um, which sort of extends from Sydney all the way down to Nara, uh, to the Blue Mountains. So quite a large nation, but um, yeah, down here in the Illawarra, we are the Wodi Wodi people. So um, I would very much like to give a very warm welcome to Andy, and um, he's going to take us through today um, having a look at how we can connect with cultures uh, within our um, communities and how we can integrate that into our teaching classrooms. Thank you, Andy. Well, thank you. And thank you for having me, Elle, and uh, the rest of the PHP, hang on, PDHPE. It's always a tongue twister up yeah. there in New South Wales. Um, I know that I've been to you know, your state conference there a couple of times now. Um, and it's always a thrill. Last last year, my friend Aaron and I, we jumped in the car and we drove six hours um, to get there and have a great couple of days. And um, the year before, I flew in and out um, to the Olympic Stadium. And I think when your committee said, hey, Andy, your session's actually on the Oval, I was thrilled. Um, you know, that was such a buzz. So, you know, being again, being able to present... Um, you know, virtually this time, but be back in person next year, hey? Um, so I'm coming from the land of Wadarong, um, and I have lived here all my life, um, growing up as a, a little boy, um, exploring the, the forests and um, everything that goes with it. Um, and it's something that I've been passionate with, probably um, more understanding of over the last 10 years um, and embedded in my curriculum. So today, as I share this presentation, I want you to keep in mind that this is my story um, and it's a way that I'm able to keep the connections of culture alive with our new children um, and help connect them with our First Nations um, traditions and games um, as well. So um, the first part of the, the story is, I guess, for you to understand where I'm from um, in terms of our First Nations and our uh, our traditions and cultures that exist. So I'm going to just share my screen now, and this is always a good one when you when you do this and you uh, you forget that it works. Um, so um, again, you know, I'm from Leopold Primary School um, out here in Geelong on the Ballerine Peninsula, um, and as I mentioned, I'm I'm from the the land of the Wadarong. Um, I did sit in on the Atchba Victoria conference not long ago, and one of the statements that came out of there was actually really, really cool. And um, there is a push in Parliament at the moment going on and a debate around Australia Post actually including the traditional lands names along with the, um, the current names of towns. Um, so that, that is one that, you know, I guess watch this space, but... It made me think that whenever I'm doing presentations now, you know, I'm from I'm from an area where I need to represent that, and what a better presentation to launch that um, off first. Um, so as we go in, um, a big acknowledgement, obviously, this week with the NATO week. Um, always, oh, I'm just going to minimise everyone here in the corner, uh, so I can actually read my presentation. There it is. Um, always will, always will be. Um, and this week is is a week where, you know, I guess we're looking at um, the Indigenous culture um, and the connection of it, especially for us in education. Um, but, you know, as I'm always a little bit apprehensive, it's not just this week we have to celebrate this and, and recognise this. It's every single week. And, and this just gives it to the forefront, forefront for 
those people in our community that maybe are not connecting with the traditions um, as much as they can, it just raises that awareness and allows us to really take a big step forward and, and bring together um, all the stories that, that uh, make up our, our journey. Um, the webinar, so today we're gonna to look at three parts. Uh, we're gonna look at what does culture look like in our school community? Um, and that's going to be the story of where I am down here in Wotherong. Um, part two is going to be, be to develop an understanding of my uh, take on inclusive culture. And part three is all together with the resources. Um, so as I, I guess one of the things I, I did last year with the, um, the state conference at Wagga Wagga, um, I really connected with Dinawang Baker and Dinawang and I have had a few conversations over the, over the point, but one of the things that Dinawang um, had, and Dinawang, for those people that weren't there, um, he was one of the keynoters and one of the points he, he made in his keynote was just something that I had done, but I really hadn't thought about it too much until he made the point of um, how we represent ourselves when we are, uh, yes, connecting in the morning or the first part of the day, or even at school sometimes is about taking your shoes and socks off and just connecting with the ground. And, um, and it wasn't until I probably got back to school and I saw one of the welfare teachers walking barefoot across the oval with a number of our students, um, then it all of a sudden came a part of that connection with land. It's a, a gravitational point, but it's also a reset button that, um, when our, our students are having a bit of trouble, trying to bring in a different texture, a different um, connection with earth, um, and then starting again. And, and this is something that, you know, I'm sitting here now with my um, bare feet, but, um, you know, our mood each day is dictated by how we feel the, the earth underneath our feet. Um, so if you get a chance, and when you're listening to this, take your shoes and socks off and just see how you are and connect yourself with the, the ground again. Um, so this is the Wadarong community. Um, I've circled where I live there in Geelong. So I'm on Karayo Bay and I'm going to zero in on that a lot more. But we extend right out uh, past um, Ballarat, um, a little bit higher up there and then across to, if you've ever been down this way, sort of looking above uh, Colac and, and that area. So it's quite a large uh, community that built up of lots and lots of different uh, tribes and traditional uh, landowners through that, that space as well. Um, when we zero in on where I am, um, and I found this actually really fascinating when I did some research on this uh, a few years ago, was the, the names that we use today uh, actually have had previous meanings. Um, and you can see again, I work at Leopold there, so I've got the, uh, the red circle around that. Um, but I grew up in Moriac, uh, Mount Moriac. So the meaning of Moriac uh, is led to believe, and all these are sort of unclear, but um, the research has, has sort of amounted to that uh, the meaning of Moriac meant big hill. Um, and where I grew there, I grew up there, there was a large hill called Mount Moriac, and um, it was a dormant volcano, but that was the, the name given to that area. Um, above that mountain, uh, we had a an area called Nawari, so said to be na a name of the local wetland. It's waterfowl, possibly same origin as Lake Connawari, which we'll come to that a little bit later. Um, Barrable, so they're a big group of hills that um, created, a, a, I guess, a ridge to the valley where I um, grew up. Um, but the, the belief there is that uh, the meaning of that might be oyster sloped down to water or rounded hill because on the back side of, of that, on the north side, is a, a large river, um, which if I go to that now, it's called the Barwon. Um, so from uh, um, Barrawong, meaning magpie, uh, same origin uh, to the town Parwan. Um, so local to this area out near Moriac is a traditional uh, animal called the the brown magpie, um, and it's only sort of found in, into that area as well. Geelong, um, the traditional name of Geelong uh, is led to believe uh, Geelong again, um, and it means the tongue of the land uh, pronounced Geelong since the European settlement. So it's had that similar um, take on it, but obviously spelled a little, a little bit differently. And then when we're getting close to where I work, uh, we have Mulap. 
Um, so meeting a place to gathering shellfish. So you can see just above on that top there, it says Stingray Bay. So I, I paddle my uh, stand-up paddleboard out in the ocean a lot. And that meaning is actually so true because underneath Stingray Bay are just shellfish. Um, and, you know, the, the, the shells of the shellfish and, and everything is just littered right through there. Um, and then below my school, we have a place called Connawari, and that's a big lake there, uh, wildlife sanctuary, and its meaning is the, for the black swan. And we have so many black swan there that nest um, and just inhabit that area. Um, north of Geelong, we have a mountain range uh, called the Yuyangs, and obviously the meaning of that is big mountains. Um, so that just gives a bit of background about my story, and I use those... Uh, definitions quite a fair bit in my um, community so the kids actually understand it um well yes yeah, so one more there is Corio. so the the bay where we are is Corio bay um so possibly uh sandy cliffs or small marsupial or wallabies so um the the definitions there are not rock solid but there are sort of a pinpoint to that and it represents the area because obviously with our traditional culture, a lot of the, the names were given to places because of what they look like or represented. Um, so in Geelong here, we have, according to the ABS, um, identified that we've only got 1.1% of the population of Geelong um, are of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander. Uh, my school has a population of 80, 820 students, and of that we have around about 45 to 50 um, students that are of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. Um, so it's imperative that we're, we're adopting that culture through uh, the curriculum. Um, a little bit about this. So this came from um, the Geelong First Nations People Community Engagement Participation Plan, uh, which was drawn up by the City of Greater Geelong. Um, and it's just a really cool artwork that actually de um, depicts what my town looks like in regards to from top to bottom. So there's the Yuyangs at the top there and, and obviously right down the bottom, you've got the sand to the ocean, um, being that we're on a sparse of around about uh, 45 to 50 kilometers from Yuyangs to ocean. But in between we have the river and we have the connecting lands and that. And then in the center there, the, the large gathering circle is a unity of diversity. Um, and it says that the diversity is of different people. The travel lines within the bottom section of the piece is the indicator of the connections to our past. Um, and this is, this is a wonderful uh, representation of the culture that exists in, in Geelong. Um, my school, Leopold, is on a hill and we're disconnected from the main town. We're our own little pocket with about 4,000 people in it. Um, but we have a transient community at times as well. So this, um, with the diversity of different peoples and the travel lines, is actually really representation of our school population. And, and we're accepting of who comes in and we praise those who go out. Um, so when I found this artwork, I thought it was actually really important to share, um, you know, and again, connecting to Indigenous culture. So as we take a look at this, um, and we're, we're talking about, the culture of our school communities and it's almost like our physical literacy continuum that we're looking at our own school community here um if we take that physical literacy continuum and we and we feed that we're feeding that with everything that the student can have access to in that wider school community and how that wider school community can influence what a school actually does with inside it um, and that's that's really critical to understand culture is the same so we're looking at the culture that uh, exists in our school and how we can feed into the community. But what is the culture that exists around our um, school that we can feed back into our school and into our students? And having that blend is, is really critical in the growth of your school. Um, Leopold Primary School is a school that I've been at on and off for 21 years. Um, so I know it inside out. You know, I love it absolutely dearly and I know every little crack and, and nook that, that exists in the community. And uh, one of my, my loves is every Wednesday, I, you know, I get out for a bit of a run and I head down to the Lake Connawari and you can see right across the waters to the ocean. Um, but as you move around, you realise that the culture has shifted um, somewhat where the growth of population has come in and the, the sleepy little town that we had 10 years ago is a lot faster paced now. Um, 
there is a lot of people coming through on a hurry rather than stopping and really understanding, you know, why Leopold is the way it is and, and where it is and the significance of where it is. Um, when I stand on top of my uh, oval, um, I have a really cool vantage point. I can actually, on a clear day, I can see three bodies of water, uh, which really keep me grounded as well. So I can see the Karaio Bay heading off to the Uyangs. I can then see around to the oceans of Torquay and Ocean Grove and living on that Ballerine Peninsula. So bringing in all that culture and connecting that into school really gives me an understanding of where I can influence the education of my physical education classes, but also giving those kids those little sprockets of, you should go and investigate that, or you should, you should actually have a look at that. Or, you know, there, there is this monument um, that's going to be down here. Why don't you take mum and dad down there on the weekend and, and get that a real appreciation? So how does culture relate to education? It plays a very important role in the development of culture, both interconnected with each other. Um, it teaches us about the social and cultural values. We know about the social values, the cultural values is that big appreciation. Um, our schools help to establish, the culture helps to establish the schools, the strength of the school. And like physical literacy, our kids pick that up and they move it to their high schools um, if we're in primary school. And if it's fostered right in there, they pick that up and they take that to the colleges and universities and then they can pick that up and take that into that workplace. So it starts, it starts young and embedding that into, into the age, you know, where kids are in prep um, or kindergarten. It's not something that I guess this NAIDOC week is fa fabulous, but if you teach everything about Indigenous studies inside one week, then the other 39 weeks of our school year, the kids will forget that. Um, and they won't get that embedded properly. So we try to give that grounding all the time with the, the cultural um, definitions and cultural connections of, of physical education, but also the beliefs and the languages, the norms and the values that come through the other students within our school as well. Um, in a diverse setting, cultural awareness involves the ability to stand back from ourselves and becoming aware of cultural values, beliefs and perceptions. Today we're talking about our um, Indigenous, our First Nation people, but let's think about a, uh, a school that's in our inner suburbs that might have uh, multiculturalism. And this applies, this whole presentation applies to exactly all of that. Um, where you are heavily influenced by a, a huge diversity of multicultures, all of a sudden that cultural um, influence mixes in and we're pulling out all these different values. Um, I was at a school for six months uh, about five years ago and the multiculturalism um, shared an entire week. Um, but what was really special is that there was performances from all the different cultures within the school and it took two or three days to get through them, um, which was wonderful. And the kids dress up in their, in their um, you know, cultural dresses and, and then perform. Um, you know, and it's just wonderful to get that appreciation of who and how kids are being fed into that communication and the, and the connection of that community. Um, when we look at... Uh, I guess a school setting, um, even with our teachers, the culture are both in connect, interconnected with each other. So if we have a look at ourselves uh, in a school position, if we only ever go to a workshop and keep that information to ourselves, we can only influence those people that are directly in front of us, which are those students. If they then keep the information to themselves, it doesn't pass anywhere. It, you know, the bubble stops. Um, doing a presentation like this today, um, you know, I'll be honest in saying that I have a passion for Indigenous studies, but I'm no expert in Indigenous studies. This is, again, my story. Um, and, you know, taking this presentation and sharing it through social medias, um, through members, the member site with uh, the New South Wales PDHPE, um, is a takeaway because we can then share that information through and forward. Um, out of a presentation like this, you might get one new idea and go, oh, I love that. And I guarantee we've got one that you're going to take away and use tomorrow in your classes. Um, but you'll take that information and you'll share it with someone else. Someone will have something that they can feed back and so on and so on. And the cycle begins. And that's what we're wanting to look with, with culture. Um, you know, we... Going, sorry, going back on that slide, we, we're looking at those children that might have that 
connection with someone else that we don't know about. And all of a sudden we can, we can bleed into that as well. Uh, I've got some students at the moment that came from East Timor um, at the start of the year and we're doing a net and wall games last term. Um, and one of the students showed me how they actually play volleyball. I can't remember for the life of me the name of the game, but volleyball with their feet. Um, and was able to play quite, quite well. Um, and this boy was in grade four. So using being able to use that culture, we were then able to visit East Timor um, virtually in the sense of trying to include that game into our physical education lessons. Um, the education teaches about social and cultural values. So having a look at that school I was at a number of years ago and taking it all the cultures that existed around the world and then trying to wrap it and put it into a package that you can then um, have for the students to understand the in a physical need is quite difficult because uh, you, you sometimes will try to over cater it. Um, however, if we take ourselves into our physical education program and we set about teaching our curriculum, it's then making those connections and masking those students and bringing that cultural understanding of the students having that voice um, and asking that one question, who has seen this game particularly uh, or a modified version in your life? You know, a student themselves might, they, you know, many of them are, are born here in Australia um, and may not have that understanding of the, the background, but some of them actually will because they'll see the mums and dads um, who potentially were born overseas um, or have a different cultural um, uh, sort of development that have been influenced to other ways of being able to play that game. So looking at that cultural value is really influential, but also looking at in a social context as well. If you give one child a ball um, in a schoolyard, they're going to have five people wanting to play with them. Um, it's the same thing if you ask one child um, in the class to share a story, you're then going to make dozens of connections with that child over that schoolyard because all of a sudden other kids will have the aha moment. Oh, I know about that one as well. So, yeah, bringing in that whole cultural values there is really important socially. Um, and then looking at the education helps to establishment of the schools, cultures and universities and understanding that we are all different. We all come from our own uh, way of life, but we've also got our own understanding of uh, how we learn um, and, you know, being able to be at home and draw out those ideas from students really give us as educators uh, ways to be able to teach things completely different that will give meaning um, to every single student, but it will also give strength and definition to what you're doing. Currently, um, you know, our last unit of work, unfortunately, we've only had two for the year, but it's Invasion Games. Um, and every time I call it Invasion Games, I, I, I shiver and I shudder because um, invasion to some cultures is exactly that, you know, and they understand that term being invaded. Um, Bernie Holland from Ashby here in Victoria refers to it as territory games. And every time I say the word invasion, I remind myself, oh, you know what, they're called territory games as well. So having that appreciation there, getting that language to flow through, you might have one child that if you use the word territory games, then they move to high school and they tell their high school teacher, hey, Mr. Ummack, um, you know, we, in primary school, we use the word territory games. That child has then influenced um, the understanding for that uh, secondary teacher who then can use that language following um, and moving through as well. The other thing is looking at, certainly with our Indigenous cultures, is, you know, a lot of, and I'll talk about this um, coming up with resources, but, you know, a lot of our games that we can connect with, you know, I guess throwing balls at targets, relate back to hunting games um, and that's coming from the Yolunga resource where you can teach the idea that okay the ball might be a boomerang and you're throwing it towards a target because that target could be um, the food that they're hunting um, and you know if you're telling that story and representing it really well um, the kids get a real understanding of it but then they start to role play that model as well um, and you can have those really deeper discussions and that's a great way of that whole inclusive model and after all you know education prepares the students uh, to deal with cultural ethics and norms okay 
Um, and this is, I guess, where we are in, in life at the moment is that we're all human. And our students definitely have a greater and deeper appreciation of that um, title than, I guess, um, my culture, or not my culture, my um, uh, childhood um, teachers did um, back in the 70s and, and early 80s. You know, we have come such a long way, but then we've got so far to go uh, as well with that understanding. And if we can reach those students, again, I've got 800 students. If I can reach 800 students um, about this, then we're doing something really, really well. Um, so that's kind of looking at that real deep technical part of uh, where I'm from, my understanding, beliefs, and I guess you know, what, what's in Andy's head when it comes to this type of language and this type of inclusive model with our cultural representations. So this is my take on cultural inclusiveness in our classes. And this is, I guess, from my lesson development. So I always start with my big idea and then I hash it out. So, you know, I'm, I'm looking at, okay, my big idea and I guess this model has come from no tosh design method so no tosh is a, an unbelievable company but if, if you google i think no tosh um uh, education design model what you get is you'll get a big worksheet and if you if you get stuck email me because i will or message me because i've got it and i'll send it out to you on google drive it is fabulous it's unreal um, so it, it's about trying to create the best ultimate lesson you can come up with with absolutely no constraints. Um, and the idea is that we will actually um, water that down to a point where we get an incredible lesson because we'll never be able to get our ultimate lesson. Let me give you an example. If I, uh, for instance, was teaching the two-hand strike with my grade two, the ultimate lesson is taking the kids um, over to the uh, New York Yankees baseball stadium and getting inside their stadium, taking my grade twos, um, first class, mind you, uh, onto the field with their pitching machines and getting every kid to be coached by a professional baseball player uh, for a week. That is my big idea, but I can't do that. So I water it down. I go, well, if I can't get to the Yankees stadium, maybe I can get to um, the Geelong Cricket Club stadium. Um, well, hang on. No, I've only got an hour with these kids, so I can't get to the Geelong Cricket Club Stadium. Oh, maybe I can get some of the Geelong Cricket Club coaches to come out to my school. Um, so I can still get that same uh, idea of the end goal because the end goal is not jumping first class on, on a plane or not going to the Yankees baseball stadium, but it's actually getting the experts in to teach the kids. Um, the other stuff is really the, uh, the provocation, the... Um, the sweetness that goes along with the, the curriculum and um, the ideas. So from that, we develop our curriculum. We then look at our ultimate resources. How are we going to be able to get this big idea fed by these resources? What's around me? What equipment do I need? Um, and, you know, is there uh, money available? So um, looking at that, you know, you're looking at, um, I guess if I'm, if I'm teaching something and I need some traditional uh, equipment from our Indigenous communities, then um, I, I would resource from our department or I would go out to one of the, um, the local areas and speak to one of the elders or the uncles there as well. Um, fostering that big idea, bringing in the experts. So talking to the experts. Um, you know, sometimes the experts aren't the great teachers in the world, but they they can be the great influencers. Um, taking great ideas, bringing them out, putting them into your big idea. Because sometimes my biggest and greatest idea is only 1% of what an expert might have. Um, so reaching out to that. Connections to culture is really important. Um, and I, I spoke to Al and I, you know, I sent this message to her that, I try to, in every single lesson I have for the week, I try to find some way of connecting that to the culture, whether it be a, an engagement game at the start, uh, whether it be um, a, um, a game that's going to actually tie the learning together, or whether it be a connections game, which is going to get us around um, in a circle and just sharing ideas and just, just having a chat. Um, because all of those, we can actually tie back to the culture of our, of our First Nations people there. And it has a really Im important influence into that. And, but we have to be deliberate in making that connection because students won't pick it up. Um, not all the time anyway, but 
yeah, making that really rich connection to it and referencing to it. Today in my territory games, um, because I teach on a hill, I was able to actually make reference that, okay, the game we just played of end zone um, in our indigenous cultures, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago, this game was played between, um, for instance, uh, Leopold and Big Hill out of Moriac. And inside that, you have so many different tribes that live in the Wadarong area. Um, and they were playing for land. They were playing for people. They were playing for animals. Um, they, they weren't playing for a trophy, but their trophies represented something else. Um, and bringing that in, and then talking about some of the brutal rules that existed in those games as well. Um, it wasn't all civil. Um, and it made them realise that uh, they were huffing and puffing over a 30-metre soccer pitch that all of a sudden when you take the game on and the extent of it is over 20, 30 kilometres, um, it gave them that real identity of where we are and, and what those landmarks are around them. Um, in that big idea as well, the intended outcomes and, and again, being deliberate in that. So if we're deliberately going to bring in a cultural perspective, we, we have to have that into our intended outcomes. Um, whether you're going to assess on it or not, or just have that as a representation of culture in there, so you're making those connections is really important. And the final one is celebrations. So looking at that deep um, connection that is going to get people to celebrate and understand that, hey, you know what, we've just done an amazing idea. Um, looking at our why, what, how. So, you know, this is in a typical lesson that I, I might write up um, to help students develop an appreciation of cultural background of movement. Um, you know, what are we going to do? The strategy of it, discuss, make reference to, participate in and use the provocations to learning outcomes and the tactics of how, you know, by embedded uh, leading engagement games that are complementary to the main focus of the unit of work. So there's the big one there that are complementary to the main focus of work, um, which is really important. There's also, I just thought I'd throw this one in, this is from Design Engineering and Science. Um, it was an article that I, I read, but it's also got two different takes on that, why, what, how, and how we actually work with that. So if you're designing something, uh, we look at the vision, the strategy, the tactics. But if you're trying to um, engineer something or the science of it, we're looking again with the why, so the vision, but then how are we actually going to move around um, with those tactics and then what will be that outcome of that? So that is really important that if we're trying to play with science, you know, present the why, let the kids go muck around um, and then come up with a strategy afterwards uh, as well. And I did a combination of those today um, in the territory games. Um, you know, looking at the connections to culture part of our units of work as well. It's looking at these three things, um, and you can throw these in different orders, whichever way you go, but each one you actually need to, need to have pretty heavy on. And the first one is um, you know, the resources. So am I equipped? Do I have the resources? Do I have the knowledge to actually take this out and, and make this work? Um, because I don't want to discredit the resources that are there or the, the cultural representation that I think might be right. Um, because it can serve as it can can actually serve as a real negative effect uh, to the kids' appreciation. The second one is looking at the elders' connections. So find those elders in your area. We have a Wadarong um, uh, community uh, facilitators that we're able to go and see, sit down, speak to, to make sure we're on the right path. We we'll also have our Uncle Brian, and Uncle uh, Brian is in the region office. Um, and will come out and lead professional developments and talk to us about uh, how he grew up and what um, influences he had in his life that he can still see that we can make contact uh, with and connections with. And the, the third one is relatable equipment. So obviously where games relate to hunting, we're not going to take the, um, the spears out, the, um, the, the hunting boomerangs. Um, and everything like that. But what do we have that we can actually use that are going to be similar? So we can have the plastic boomerangs. Um, you know, in terms of our, our you know, spears, we can have plastic balls. We can have our um, little rubber scoops and stuff like that to help us learn that, you know, if we can throw a ball, we can play a game, um, we can potentially, if we take this back to, to our cultural um, ancestors, then we can go hunting um, and we can be effective at that of that, if we can't 
throw a ball or learn to throw something, we're going to be ineffective to be able to um, hunt, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and what's the outcome of that? Um, you know, if we can't hunt, we can't, uh, we can't eat. Um, and having those discussions with kids, actually, it just gives them that real sense of, okay, I can see how this can relate now. And then you put it into their perspective and you go, well, you know, what do you want to do when you grow up? Well, you know, I might want to play tennis. Well, you know, if I can't throw a ball, I might not be able to hit a ball with forehand strike, which means that I might not be able to go and play tennis at that time that I want to. Um, so looking at those actions and those outcomes and keeping children within the, the lessons. Here's, you know, probably arguably one of the greatest um, uh, resources in this country. And it's called the Yalunga Resource. I've got a link um, in my resource section at the end. And the Yalunga Games is a um, resource created by the Australian Sports Commission. And it is brilliant. It teaches you about the background of the game. Um, when you are, you know, I guess, working backwards or forwards, I tend to work, work backwards. I look at what I'm going to teach and then look backwards and find their connections, games from our, um, our Yolunga resource and then implement them in and then make reference to this. So this one is really important. Um, so the, the resource on the right is from Yolunga. Um, the resource on, sorry, the resource on the left is the Yolunga one. The resource on the right is a, a document, a, a book that I wrote for the International Cricket Council. Um, and you can see the connector game there um, on that, that side page. And that is the same um, as, oh, here we go. He's going to get my pronunciation. I can never pronounce these right. The Arken uh, Eri Eri Me. Um, I'm going to leave it there. I'm not going to even go again. But uh, that resource there, we can then take that game and we can relate that um, back to. So we can share the background of that. Um, and then we can really understand that. So then when we translate it across um, and we're playing the game that we know it now, we actually have a background to where this game may have been um, developed and then a rule has altered, a rule has altered, a rule has altered to change it into the game that we know now. Let's face it, everything that we do in physical education and movement has come from a culture somewhere. All we've done is added a rule here, tweaked a rule there, dressed up a colour here, um, you know, brought in a different piece of uh, equipment here to change that game around. So this is really an important way to be able to look at things. Um, so a couple of suggestions from myself is what should you do? So make all lessons culturally inclusive. Um, after all, they are the lessons to teach our students about the world that they live in. Use cultural activities as engagement tools or setting the pathway for units of work. Um, keep it organic and do your homework before your lesson. I've done this before. I've got up, I you know, thought I knew everything, got up and then absolutely got tongue-tied inside a lesson and realised that the story I was telling, I was starting to make up on the spot. So do your homework first uh, with that. And don't teach the content. Make the content flow with your lesson narratives. Um, on my YouTube channel, Mr. Hair Phys Ed, um, there's a couple of um, presentations I've done there that are all about the using the narratives to make um, connections flow. Um, and a couple of recommendations what I suggest you shouldn't do is stay away from celebrating your community's cultures for just one week. Um, and as I said to start with, include them in your lessons all year round. Um, and just don't make it up. Do your research. Uh, going to the multicultural school, um, you know, where I was for six months, I had to be so careful in how I taught because there were so many cultures there. I was not over all of them or even not any of them. Um, they were the experts in the room. And if I had made it up, I was caught out um, big time. So... Do the research or the students are the leaders. How good is that? And don't single students out that they are representative of that culture. They are learning too. So as I mentioned that many of our Indigenous students today are, you know, well and truly, they're all born here. Um, many of our cultural students, multicultural students are born here as well. Um, sometimes they don't know the stories of their backgrounds as well. So, you know, being able to involve them in the learning is, is really important. Um, these next four pages, I just made this, uh, I guess, as an identification of your own syllabus. So, 
you know, when we're looking at, and as I was, I was really amazed to see how many connections there was to cultural um, learning in just physical education and health. So stage one, we were looking at, you know, how we can participate safely and fairly during physical education. Um, and we found there was two connections there that we can try to tick off on um, and make reference to. Um, what influences my decisions and actions to be healthy, safe and physically active? Again, two more connections there. So this is a great way of being able to uh, keep these in your pocket as you're planning lessons and going, okay, am I doing this in this week's um, lesson? Can I tick this off if I'm going to be audited? Uh, stage two, I was really happy with this one because we actually had four, um, four points there that we can bring in. Um, each with a couple of identifiers there as well. Stage three, we had even more. Um, and stage four started to people down a little bit, but will be a lot deeper there. Um, I didn't do stages five and six. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Um, but I thought our, our, certainly our secondary teachers there, um, looking that up, making those connections in. If you find the syllabus um, super duper long, put in those keywords into find and, and away you go from there and, and find those. Um, those stages and the, the, I guess the identifiers that you're working with. Um, whoo, big breath here. Resources, this is the exciting one. Here you go, one page. So we've got obviously your standards um, that we're working by. And I truly hope that I got the right one there. Um, I know that we were working through that last year uh, at the conference and, and it was um, coming in there. So I apologize if I have got the wrong one. There's your, your Lunga resource, your Lunga Traditional Games resource. Unreal, that is fantastic. And it's complemented by um, the Indigenous tradition, Traditional Games, which is from Sport uh, uh, New South Wales. So those three resources there will be enough to guide you into having that real cultural representative, representation in your health and physical education classes. Um, and I really urge they're both free downloads, but that Yolunga one, like you can search again on the website for what you're after, and it will bring up a number of games that you can go, I know where that fits. I know where that fits. Wow, have a look at this one. Have a look at that one. Um, and, uh, and then making those connections as well with um, potentially our schools that we, we have that actually run these programs really well. Um, I seek a lot of advice from uh, two teachers up in Arnhem Land, um, two teachers over in Catherine as well, and sort of run things by them at the same time when I'm teaching this, um, because I, I need to really understand, um, I guess, where some of the accessible outcomes are, but making sure that I'm on the right track as well. Because um, again, the stories that I I tell in schools are the stories that kids believe are actually going to be the right ones to, to teach. Um, Al, I might leave this one to you. This was one of your um, uh, slides. Yeah, I apologise. Um, my video decided to just drop out halfway through. Um, so I thought I'd add to the resources that Andy has mentioned and the um, the resource booklets for um, the Yalunga is just absolutely amazing. Um, I definitely recommend that one there. Um, but the next few ones that we're just going to go through, if you go onto the New South Wales DSC website, so you could scan this one here on screen, um, they obviously give you a lot of information around Aboriginal education and the support um, in that area. What I found was fascinating was that they actually have in some schools some instructional leaders um, for introducing um, Indigenous cultures into the school. Um, you know, that would just, if that's obviously something that started, it would be great to be able to see that continue to happen. So that's on the um, public schools website um, and then the next one is um, do you want to just flick through to the next one Andy? Oh yep. No, you're right. Um, is for the Association of Independent Schools so they also have a section on their website um, that provides you with some different links to um, to access. I think one of their most um, I guess powerful resources that they provide is a consultancy support Mm -hmm. um, for both primary and secondary schools and that's where they actually have um, consultants within the AIS um, New South Wales who are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, who come and you know provide cultural awareness training 
um, talk to you about how you can embed the cultural awareness within your schools, within your teaching. Um, and I think, you know, something that really has sort of come through from listening to Andy today is just to know uh, the facts, know the stories that you're telling. And this is the that services that AOS New South Wales provides is um, a really good one to help you know the cultural story of your school and the area that you come from. Um, the next one is the um, New South Wales AACG, so the Aboriginal Education Consultative Group. Um, these guys have actually released an app as well as their very comprehensive website. Um, on their website, they've got lots of different contacts that you can get in touch with within your area, but also a lot of resources um, for integrating culture within your, within your lessons. Um, but their new app that they just developed is actually a lot around the languages of different areas um, in New South Wales. Um, interestingly, when I found this one, there are actually a lot of other um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander applications on the App Store that you can actually get. But this one I thought was really clever, um, especially thinking about what Andy was saying earlier about using the, the correct language for your physical surroundings that your school um, is involved in. I thought that was quite powerful. So that app could be really helpful. Mm. Um, and then something else um, that's quite interesting that I found is that the University of Sydney um, ran a program online. Um, it's called the Aboriginal Kingship Program. Um, and basically it's just, it's informing us about um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and having an understanding of how their kinship system operates and their social structures. Um, so that thing, just back to that concept of informing us as educators and, you know, learning the truth about, um, you know, our cultural history and our cultural past. And um, that one was something that was really interesting. So that one is uh, free through the Sydney University. So you can scan that and it sends you straight to the module. Um, and then the last one I had there um, was the Reconciliation New South Wales website which looks at um, giving you resources to um, become culturally competent, um, which I thought was a really um, interesting thing again, mm. that making sure that we're telling the right stories. Um, and I think also to it, it highlights that it's okay that we, some of us don't know um, the stories and, you know, and it also gives us space to, to learn um, but also highlights what Andy said, the importance of, you know, engaging communities, engaging students to think about um, the cultural stories that they know um, of the area. So they're just a couple. There are so many others. There's, if you do a search for um, local support services within your area, you'll find a lot of um, smaller um, cultural groups that can be of support for connecting students or connecting yourself to elders. Um, or people within your community to help come and help you with those big ideas that Andy was talking about. Um, but yeah, they're just some pretty broad New South Wales ones that can be helpful. Yeah, that's fantastic. And that just adds more depth um, to what you're doing. And, and looking at that, we can, we can all pick up a resource and, and teach from it, but actually understanding uh, the whole background of it's really important. So I'm glad you showed all those as well. Um, team, that, that brings us to the end. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen in a minute, but if you have any idea or any questions or anything like that, please connect with me. Um, either on Twitter is always the, the best one to, to do it with. But if you're not on Twitter, just go to my website there. Or I know that um, our team here uh, will probably just throw my details up there anyway. I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, to email me and we can I can share you this PowerPoint. Um, that way you can tear it apart and uh, and add slides that you need to do to do further presentations at your school as well. Um, El, I'm going to leave you this one. Thanks. Um, Andy, thank you so much for your time today. Um, I loved hearing about your story and um, where you're from. Um, you know, it's really interesting. I very much connect with the Geelong area. It's a bit of a, I guess, very similar to where I grew up um, here in, I guess, on the south coast of New South Wales. So um, it was just so 
beautiful to hear that you actually connect the um, the Indigenous land. And when you said to us, oh, you know, take your shoes off. <laughs> I took my shoes off and I was like, oh, man, what, why did I do that earlier in the day, you know? <laughs> um, so it was really good to hear that you've just some really simple things. Like I know the other night you reached out to me and said, oh, um, yeah, I do something every day to try and connect to culture. And I was like, oh, my gosh, that's just amazing. I can't even fathom it. But now I feel like, you know, there's actually some really small, simple changes that we can make, um, you know, that, that don't have to take a lot of work or research or knowledge. So I really appreciate you sharing um, both your story, but also your experiences with connecting to culture and, and how we can go about it as teachers. I think that's a really powerful thing because we're you know often at times a little timid to dive into this area and think about how we can do that so thank you for sharing that um if anyone is uh interested in presenting please contact um myself um and we will arrange for an opportunity for you to present to our members in future webinars Thanks, and maybe if I could just jump in because I know Kelly's itching at the bit to probably get away as well mm -hmm. um Th thanks, Andy, because um, for me, there's a couple of things that I just reflect on in what I, I listen to. And I really enjoy the presentation. But, uh, you know, firstly, I recently did have a trip down to that beautiful part of the world. And uh, it is uh, stunning when you fly into Geelong to see that area around there. Um, not so impressed with your golf course at Barwon and 13th Creek further down. They are rather challenging in, because the wind blew from all directions. But that's part of, part of country, I suppose. Um, but lovely place. Secondly, you mentioned around the Australia Post project. It just reminded me that in the department, a lot of our people now in their Zoom meetings are actually putting, because we're all over the place, they're actually mm -hmm. putting the lands on which they are seated. And it's a nice little connection. So I put Alan Booth Durrard. Um, and it's across of a Zoom meeting. That was a nice little uh, thing that's happened. I guess reflecting on my own career, one thing you said it was talking about coming such a long way. Uh, my first appointment was at Warriola up in north <clears throat> northwest um, New South Wales. And I guess when I think back those 40 years ago, um, the Mile Creek Massacre was very close to there. And I've spent a bit of time learning more and more about that. And um, it's an incredibly moving story, which has really only come out. But to think that we're now further down the track at the end of my career, I was able to go out to the return of Mungo Man's remains out in the uh, Mungo National Park, which was probably one of the most moving spiritual experiences I've ever had in terms of connection to country and connection to land, and lots of stories I could share about that. But finally, the other thing that really hit home with me, the project I'm working on at the moment, Quality Teaching Rounds, is around uh, uh, practice. And the element of significance we know from research is such an important part of learning and such an important part of teaching practice. And that particular model uh, and the elements within significance remind us in every lesson of the opportunities that we can build into each lesson. So in our discussions around how we can build significance, how we can build better understanding. So, you know, your message about taking every opportunity in every lesson, I think, is reflected in that. So I've, I've learned a lot just from listening. Really enjoyed the stories and thank you uh, on behalf of everyone. Really, it was so... Uh, yeah. Same well here, Sandy. And I think having not grown up in this country, um, it was so insightful for me. I always connect my, my homeland of, of Wales. So um, it, it was really good learning for me. And, you know, like in everything we do to be research informed, I... Um, I think that's really good advice, but um, equally, I've just joined meetings and seen everyone having that land up, Alan. I'm new to this this area where we've moved, and I don't know enough, so that's going to be my homework over the next few nights to go and um, do a little bit of research myself. So, so thank you for making me um, culturally aware. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, my pleasure. Look, you know, and, and that's the thing. It's it's about um, informing for people to go, oh, you know what? I actually need to do more. Um, and, you know, all the, all the answers are there. It's just, I think, making that commitment and just going, okay, I need to do this. Um, and I need to do this for me. Um, this is my professional growth. Um, I apologise. I, I, my computer, right at the very last minute, it decided to restart. So it always happens. Um, 
but yeah, no, thank you again for hosting me. And, and I would have loved to have taken you out and done this in the middle of Cryo Bay. Um, I've done that a couple of times, but um, where all the shellfish are and then just even make, made it even culturally uh, representative of where we were. Um, and there was a presentation that I did do, just a small one with some friends from over in America. And um, our Cryo Bay has uh, a split in it um, halfway where um, they, they ended up um, putting a shipping channel in there. But on low tide, two or 300 years ago, they used to march the sheep across. Um, and, you know, not 300 years ago, but yeah, march the sheep across the middle um of it so it's actually quite shallow and you go out there now and you can stand right in the middle on the reef um and you see all the the marine life that has just been there for so many so many years so um you know i get out on my bike and and run and paddle all the time and it's just it's connecting with the community that we are we're in it's just not um going as fast as i can and just not having the insight to look around um and those stories then relate back to where we are in in education um and it's influencing and passing that information on so yeah again thank you so much for having me and you know anytime i'm always happy to share different things uh from down here and as i said hopefully we'll get up next year and be able to see everyone in person again that will be great andy thank you and thank you al for your for your time organizing this and um elizabeth if you can listen in um just remember that we have those two others on in the in the near future as well so thank you it's great to see your face andy and thanks to all of you thank you bye um bye. presentation so i'll say goodbye and thanks again I don't want to see ya.